So what happened last week, Jake, our, our student minister, who did a great job last week, uh, Jake, if you're, if, you don't, if you're new to our church, we have an awesome middle school and high school ministry here, led by Jake and an awesome team of volunteers, and Jake preaches up here on Sunday morning from time to time and does an awesome job. So if you were here last week, I'm not trying to call you out if you weren't, but if you were here last week, we thank Jake for preaching and doing an awesome job. It's just great. Or everybody can do that. After... After Jake preaches on a Sunday, I feel the need to go, hey, good morning, I'm not Jake, I apologize, hang in there for 30 minutes. That's, that's, how, that's how I feel. So he talked about the conquest of Jericho, where God said, there's Jericho, here's the instructions, go get it. That land is yours, those walls are going to come down, here's how it's going to go down, go get it. But he also said, there's one thing I want to instruct you. And here's what he tells them. They're going to Jericho, they're cleaning house. He says, keep yourselves from the things set apart or you'll be set apart for destruction. If you take any of those things, as in don't steal the Canaanites' stuff, don't take it with you. I'm giving you all the promised land to enjoy. I'm just saying do not covet or steal their things. You don't need those things. You have everything from me. He says, so if you do it, that destruction is gonna make trouble for Israel. For all the silver and gold, stuff a lot of us would want, and the articles of bronze and iron, they're dedicated to the Lord. God's the one who owes every, owns everything, and he's with you, so you don't have to go steal someone else's stuff. And it must go into the Lord's treasury. So here's the instructions. Go get the land. Go get it. Here's the conquest. The Jericho walls are going to come crashing down, and you're going to go in there, and you're going to inhabit the land just as I promised you. Just don't take their silver and gold and their treasury and their stuff. That's the only instruction. But just like us, they said, is God holding out on us? But just like us, I feel this way often. Whenever I sin, which I do far too often, I'm believing the lie there's more to be gained by disobeying God than there is to be gained by obeying him. And I'm believing the lie I've got to go around him for all the things I'm looking for rather than right to him. I don't believe that he has my best interest in heart. So the journey of the Christian life is a journey of faith, of believing that God really is best, that he really is better than anything this world has to offer. And just like we do today, they didn't buy that fully. Maybe 99% they believed it, but not fully. So they had to get that treasury, even though God said no. So he says, here's the instructions. And what's the next chapter, chapter 7? A few verses later. The Israelites, however, not a great way to start a sentence. Here's the instructions. Here's what happened, the Israelites, however. It's like, do you want the good news or the bad news first? The Israelites, however, were unfaithful. What an accusation. Unfaithful. I pray regularly in my own personal prayers, God, let me be found faithful. And I'm thankful that I'm not found faithful, that he is always faithful and restores us over and over again. But what a prayer for your own life. God, let me be found faithful. Pray that for the leaders of this church, that we will be found faithful. Regarding the things set apart for destruction, Achan, here's the culprit, son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, he put his grandparents and great-grandpa on on blast here, of the tribe of Judah, took some what was set apart. The one thing I told you not to do, and you go and do the opposite. And what happened? The Lord's anger burned God does get angry, and apparently his anger burns against his own people, against the Israelites. And I'm a simple guy, so I ask simple questions. And when I see that they sinned against God, that Achan did the opposite of what God instructed, rebelled against him, said, God, no thanks, I want to do what I want, not what you want, and then God being angry, here's the question I want to ask you on the screen here. Is that a big deal? I mean, is it a big deal? that he said no to God? Is it a big deal that God is angry? Is it a big deal that God said do this and he did the opposite? I mean, does it really matter? And the answer to that question is going to depend on our view of God. He's probably going, it's just a few things. I know he said not to do that, but we just like cleaned house in Jericho and I just grabbed a few stuff for our family. They're not going to notice. We're just going to kind of put it in the mix here. And it's really not that big of a deal unless you believe that God is holy. And if God is holy, and our minds can't even fully grasp what that is like, then any sin against him is a big deal. And he can't let sin go unpunished and be a holy God. I was in London last year visiting our church plant there in Queens Park in the west side of the city. 
And I went into, I'm, I'm very, very cultured, so I'm in London, I went into a Starbucks, uh, Go USA, and I went in there, and as I walked in, everybody's like trying to find these like really trendy coffee shots. I'm like, where's the mermaid sign? Like, take me to her, or whatever it is on a Starbucks sign. And I went in, there's this big sign on the wall here in the Starbucks in Queen's Park in London, and it says 99% of our products are ethically sourced. It's like, look at us. We are so good. We are such a righteous company. 99% of our stuff, ethical. And my first thought was, man, are they 1% unethical? Like, how does that work? Are, are they 1% not doing well? Are they 1% unrighteous? Are their ethics only 99% of the time? And the thought is, if we have a small view of God, then we have a 99% ethical kind of approach with him. And we go, everybody makes mistakes. Is it really a big deal? God knows my heart. Like, like I'm sincere, and, and we'll just kind of do better next time. You're not perfect either, you know, kind of mindset. Because as long as we're 99% ethical and moral, then we think God's happy with us, and the 1%, the 2%, the 10% isn't that big of a deal. So here's the scene. They've conquered Jericho, now they're exploring the land, going to see different parts of it, and they come upon the city of Ai, and it's pronounced Ai. It's A-I, pronounced Ai. And Ai is a smaller town. They don't have the huge army and the huge fortress like Jericho did. So they're thinking, we don't really need a lot of troops to go in. Like, we're Alabama playing a, you know, an FCS school. We can pull our starters out in the third quarter, you know, kind of idea. They're smaller. They're not a huge threat. We just whipped Jericho. We just cleaned house there. We don't got to send everybody into I. Like, we're the mighty army of God. We've got this. And what's going to happen here is God is going to wind up saying, not so fast, my friends. You only whipped Jericho because I was with you. And you took down Jericho only because I'm the one who made it happen. And here now, my people set apart, and Achan, who's part of this group, has deliberately disobeyed my law and my word, and you assume you're just going to roll in and kick butt again because their army is smaller? What kind of view of me do you have? And here's how it went down. The men of Ai struck down. This is the same army that just cleaned house in mighty Jericho. The men of Ai struck down about 36 of them, and oh, how the tables have turned and chased them. How humiliating. Now they're on the run. The conquesters are on the run from outside the city gate to the quarry, striking them down on the descent. As a result, the people lost heart. And I would lose heart too. Wait, didn't God make a promise to us? That he's always going to be with us? that he gave us this land, and here we are just our second battle in, and we've already been destroyed. There's a temptation when we see things in the Bible we don't like to want to kind of explain it away and make excuses for God. So some commentators that don't want to deal with the actual facts of what's taking place here and the seriousness of sin in the eyes of a holy God, they say things like, they were too overconfident, that's why it happened. They didn't pray enough before they went in is another thing people like to say. But the question we have to ask as we see this text is, why did they lose? They are a smaller town. They are a smaller army. Their smaller group they sent in absolutely could have handled the task. And then we see verse 11. Why did this happen? Because Israel has sinned. And not just made a mistake we must realize in sin, first and foremost, who that sin is ultimately against. It's against God himself. He says, here's how they've sinned. They've violated my covenant, my relationship with them, that I appointed for them. It was my idea. It was my doing. They've taken some of what was set apart. And again, my mind wants to go, is that really that big of a deal? But for, for a holy God, it is that big of a deal, as we'll see as we go forward. They've stolen, which is a violation of the Ten Commandments. They've deceived, the text says, another Ten Commandments. They've lied. They also coveted another Ten Commandments. There's breaking Ten Commandments left and right. They put their things in their own belongings. This is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They will turn their backs and run for their enemies because they have been set apart for destruction. I will no longer be with you unless you remove from among you what is set apart because sin cannot be in the presence of a holy God. So go and consecrate the people, a renewal type ceremony. Tell them to consecrate themselves for tomorrow. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. 
There are things that are set apart among you, Israel. You will not be able to stand against your enemies until you deal with the sin, until you remove what is set apart. In the morning, God's timetable, again, very detailed instructions here. Present yourselves tribe by tribe. The tribe the Lord selects is to come forward clan by clan. The clan the Lord selects is to come forward family by family. The family the Lord selects to come forward man by man, because the man's taking responsibility for his family. The one who is caught with a thing set apart must be burned. And I read that and go, whoa, I want to sing Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. And here it says that the ones that get caught are going to get burned along with everything he has. And I go, well, that sounds unreasonable. That sounds extremely harsh. That's like some kind of vengeful God that doesn't make sense to me. But then there's the comma. Because he has violated the Lord's covenant and committed an outrage in Israel. And the question I have to ask in response to that, is that a big deal? So here's the scene. God tells Joshua to tell all the people to get ready for judgment in the morning. God is going to judge sin. They cast lots, as they were instructed. Achan is the one who has sinned, and they confront him. And Achan confesses and owns up to everything. He can't deny it, as if God didn't already know when he took that treasury and put it in his own bag. That's the crazy thing about our sin and what it does to us. When I'm in sin and when you're in sin, how often are we more concerned that somebody else knows than we are the fact that God already knows? I mean, how dependent on the grace of God are we? And what happens as a result? Everyone stones him. Stones him. Is that harsh? Well, it depends on how you view God. And I'm not saying I had the market cornered on how we're supposed to view God. But the scriptures do. As I read through this and prepared this, I wrestled with it probably as much as some of you are right now hearing it. Here's reality. You are alive and breathing right now. Only because of God's incredible patience with you and grace with you and mercy for you and love for you. That's it. And that's not me being a fatalist. A fatalist is someone who falls down a set of stairs and says, God, thank you, that's over. You know, that kind of mindset. Achan had sinned other times. He's a human. This was not the first time in his life he had ever sinned against the holy God. But God had been patient and long-suffering, slow to anger, abounding in love. And here's what we must know if you're going to understand the Christian faith. This is so important because Jesus doesn't make sense without it. Christmas is pointless return the pastel dress at Easter, like, none of it makes sense, unless this is true. God is holy, people are sinful, the world is broken as a result of sin, and his judgment is just. God is holy, he is perfectly good and righteous. Us, we are very different. People are sinful. And because of sin, it's why we have so many things around us that show us brokenness. That's why there's abuse and pain and pornography and broken relationships and unforgiveness and racism and disasters. And ultimately, it's why there is death. The wages of sin is death. Sometimes it just gets carried out faster for others than maybe somebody sitting in this room but the mortality rate is still 100% the last time I checked in Tallahassee, Florida because the world is broken. And we're told because of Jesus, the last enemy to be, de- to be defeated will be death because he gives us eternal life in Christ. That also means this, that God's judgment is just even if we don't fully understand it. It takes some humility to go, you know what, I don't understand everything. And God tells us people out in the Bible over and over again, he says things like, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. We can't fully even come close to comprehending him. 
He's given us his word to give us a glimpse of who he is and to give us what we actually need to know. But even if I don't get it or don't want it, he is still just. There's also some Garden of Eden parallels here for Achan. In the Garden of Eden, God said, Adam and Eve, here's all this for you to enjoy. Here is this promised land. You have a chance to flourish and to thrive and to enjoy me and be in unhindered fellowship with me. I told you to be fruitful and multiply, enjoy each other, raise your family. But this is all yours except don't eat from that fruit on that tree. Rather than going, wow, God's been so good to us. Who cares about the trees? Give us everything else. They were like, oh, what's on that tree? He's holding out on us. So what happens? They eat the fruit, disobey God, and we see the story of the scriptures unfold. But the answer is a yes, it is a very big deal. But thankfully, where we see sin, we see God already in the process of restoring, forgiving, reconciling a people to himself. But it wouldn't be ultimate yet because Christ has not come. So what happens is, here's Achan, here's the whole land I promised you. Just don't take treasury from there. And he went, whoa, maybe God doesn't have my best interests. Maybe he is holding out on me. So what does he do? He believes there's more to be gained by disobeying God than there's to be gained by obeying him, and he rebels. Then Israel raises a pile of stones over Achan's body as a memorial to the sin that brings about death. And then the script changes, and I would be taken by God's people, and the people would be destroyed. See this in chapter 8. The Lord said to Joshua, don't be afraid or discouraged. I'd be like, don't be afraid or discouraged. See what just happened here? He goes, I have not broken my promise. I'm still with you. Y'all are the ones who have moved. Like, I'm still here. Don't be afraid or discouraged. Take all the troops with you. Now, everybody, I'm going to show you my power. Take the whole group and go attack I. Look, I've handed over. It's already been predetermined by God's sovereignty. I've handed over to you the king of Ai, his people, city, and land. Treat Ai and its king as you did Jericho and its king, except that you may plunder its spoil and livestock for yourselves. Go take it. So he's going to get some military strategy. Set an ambush behind the city. And the Lord said to Joshua, he's going to show Joshua and the people they're fully dependent on him him, his power, his way, his direction. Hold out the javelin in your hand towards I, for I will hand the city over to you. So Joshua held out his javelin towards it. He probably felt dumb for a second doing so. This is weird, but then he sees God at work and orchestrating his will to be done. When he held out his hand, the men in ambush rose quickly from their position. They ran, entered the city, captured it, and immediately set it on fire. The men of Ai turned and looked back, and smoke from the city was rising to the sky. They could not escape in any direction, and the troops who had fled to the wilderness now became the pursuers. When Joshua and all of Israel saw the men in ambush had captured the city, and that smoke was rising from it, they turned back and struck down the men of Ai. The men in ambush came out of the city against them, and the men of Ai were trapped between the Israelite forces, some on one side, some on the other. They struck them down until no survivor or fugitive remained. But they captured the king of Ai alive and brought him to Joshua. When Israel had finished killing everyone living in Ai, who had pursued them into the open country, and every last one of them had fallen by the sword, all Israel returned to Ai and struck it down with the sword. The total of those who fell that day, both men and women, was 12,000, all the people of Ai. Joshua did not draw back his hand that was holding the javelin until all the inhabitants of Ai were completely destroyed. Israel plundered. Only the cattle and spoil of the city for themselves according to the Lord's command. A totally different approach, following God's commands that he had given Joshua. And you read that and you say, wow, did you just read out loud at church that God killed 12,000 innocent people? Well, it's important to know that that's not how he sees them. These people are all part of an inherently wicked culture of Canaanites that if allowed to live would morally and theologically pollute the people of Israel. Michael Kruger says this, the timing of God's judgment doesn't always match human expectations. Sometimes we think God should judge the most sinful people first and kind of work down the list. But God doesn't always work the way that we expect. In fact, Jesus made this exact point 
when asked why the Tower of Siloam collapsed and killed a bunch of people. And Jesus replies from Luke chapter 13, he said, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the other people who lived in Jerusalem? Do you think the tower fell and people died because they're worse than you? Is that really what you think? He goes, hold on. I tell you, unless you repent, this is the words of Jesus, you all likewise will perish. Like, guess what? Like, you're going to face God's just judgment of sin, too. This might be a few weeks, a few months, a few years after them. Our minds can't really grasp that, but our, God does not operate by our ways and our calendar. When, and he isn't obligated to judge everyone simultaneously. People don't have to be the worst of sinners on the scale to receive the judgment of God. While the Canaanites maybe weren't the only you know, sinful people in the world, and maybe not even the worst, their sins were heinous. God drove them out of the land primarily because their practices were what the Bible called detestable. Gross idolatry, sorcerers, mediums, sexual perversion, sacrificing their own children to their gods. And the external threats of the surrounding nations and people became an internal threat to God's people. Rather than them being a light in a dark place, the dark place was influencing them. So Israel is becoming more and more like people who don't know God rather than becoming more like God himself. So after this happens, we see the tables again fully turned. At the time, Joshua built an altar at Mount Ebal to the Lord, the God of Israel. Just as Moses, the Lord's servant, had commanded the Israelites. And then we're going to see as the text goes forward that he was instructed to read the word of God from Moses to the people to recenter everyone back on the scriptures, to remind them of who God is, to remind them of who they are. We see in verse 35, there was not a word of all that Moses had commanded that Joshua did not read before the entire assembly of Israel, including the women, the dependents, and the resident aliens who lived among them. That shows us that being God's people was not by ethnicity, it was by faith that non-Israelites came into the family of God as resident aliens during this time. Kyle Dillon says this, the people of Israel had a unique calling as God's chosen covenant people. Their task was to prepare the way of arrival for the Messiah. Therefore, Israel's own mission foreshadowed Jesus' mission in a number of ways. Their purity laws, all the rules that God gave them in the Old Testament, it pointed to the holiness demanded by God that we were unable to keep that pointed us to our need for a savior. The sacrificial laws pointed to our need for atonement, that there had to be a blood sacrifice from the animal, bloodshed, death, to atone and cover sins. Their warfare pointed to God's just judgment against sin. And in all these respects, Israel's laws were signposts to the spiritual realities behind Christ's redemptive work for us. So when you read such a tough text like this and try to wrestle with it, my challenge to myself and to you is to remember God's mercy. As a Gentile, I would be on the Canaanite side of this story. So therefore, I am a living example of God's grace. The wages of sin is still death. That hasn't changed. If it wasn't, then the cross makes no sense because God on our behalf paid the wage of debt by Jesus who never sinned standing in our place and dying a death that we deserved. It's easy, it's so easy to like believe Christian things, like believe the cross, believe Good Friday, believe Jesus rose from the grave, like believe all these things, but then allow ourselves to kind of wander away and go, well, God shouldn't punish sin. Well, God shouldn't act that way. And the reality is the whole essence of our faith is that God punished sin, but not us. That Jesus stood in our place. Christ paid the wage. God is fully responsible for our salvation. He owes it to no one. I recently read a pastor who had a conversation with a church member out in the lobby after the service. They sang Amazing Grace that Sunday morning. The guy came and said, man, I just, I can't sing Amazing Grace. He's like, why not? It's a classic. Like, it's, you know, 
It's on, especially on bagpipes, it's like goosebumps, you know, kind of thing. It's like, what do you mean you can't sing Amazing Grace? And he said, well, I read the story about the man who wrote the song, John Newton. He was a slave trader. I can't sing that song. Written by a slave trader? You kidding? I can't believe we even sing that song in our church. And he goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know he wrote that song after he became a Christian. And God gave him grace, and he repented from that heinous industry. Industry. He repented from that and denounced it, and he was so amazed that God would forgive him and show him love and mercy despite his actions for so many years that he took out his pen and wrote Amazing Grace. And he goes, well, uh, uh, sure, but he still did it. He still did it. And the pastor looked back at him and said, why don't you go back and read the first two lines of the song? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Why was it a sweet sound? It saved a wretch like me, a slave trader. I once was lost, gone. But now I'm found. I was so blind to the things of God, I could justify this industry. I could justify this sinful behavior. I could justify being indifferent towards God, rebelling against him, shrugging my shoulders about Jesus. But now, because God is so gracious and his grace is so amazing, I can see. I have new eyes, a new heart, a new life. Here's the book of Psalms says, he has not dealt with us as our sins deserve or repaid us according to our iniquities. Be not mistaken, he will get justice for sin. But his justice was fully realized and understood at the cross. For as high as the heavens are above the earth. I don't know how high that is. That high. So great is his faithful love. Remember in Joshua, unfaithful to people. God, faithful. Towards those who fear him. Towards those who know him or are in relationship with him. As far as the east is from the west. So far as he removed. We didn't remove them ourselves removed our transgressions from us. So stories like this are hard pills to swallow, but they point us to Christ. If we're aware of the holiness of God and see this story here, what happened in I, we could never say things out loud with a straight face, like all roads lead to the same place. All roads can lead to the same place if there is not a holy God who shrugs his shoulders against sin. But then it wouldn't even make sense that there is a place. Like, what is, how, how does God operate? How does God function? Like, th- those are such empty arguments. The reality is that God is a holy God, that people are sinful, the world is broken, and you know what he's doing? He's restoring and rebuilding and making it new in Jesus Christ. And since he rose from the grave, we can believe everything that it says in this Bible and really trust him when he says the last enemy to be defeated is death. And any Christian who takes their last breath on this earth walks in to the new promised place of God and realizes in that moment that death actually has been defeated and that God has kept his promise because the wages of sin have not changed. There still is a debt to pay, but God paid it for us. How amazing is that? The one who made the demands, perfection, which he has the right to do because he's holy. If he didn't demand perfection, then he wouldn't be holy. It would be a contradiction there. The one who made the demands also met the demands for us. Isn't that incredible? So when you hear things like God loves you, that's not just some random sentimental old-fashioned Hallmark card. This is what it's talking about. That he so loved the world, as in you and me, that he gave his only son. Sir so believes in him. Not required a theology degree, not a five star varsity level Christian, but faith that Jesus really is the one he claimed to be. Those people aren't going to perish. The last enemy to be defeated is death, they're going to have eternal life. So let stories like this definitely, again, we're humans, it makes you raise your eyebrows and go, whoa. I didn't hear that story in Sunday school. 
probably because the curriculum wasn't very good. But that's another story for another time. <laughs> We're going to tell you what the Bible says here. Because it points us to Christ, points us to grace, points us to mercy. And that's the story of the Bible. A holy God reconciling a broken people to himself. You're not too far away. It's not too late. He has not forgotten about you. You have not out his grace. It's available to you if you'll trust in him by faith that he is the one who defeats the final enemy and he is the one who pays our wage. Let's pray together. Before I, before I pray, right where you're sitting, just quietly, just, on, just silently in your own mind and heart, I think it's important at church that we pray. We'd love for you to pray that when you, pray, pray a version of this prayer just between you and the Lord. And if you never prayed before, we're going to help you figure out how to pray right now, just in your own heart and mind, just silently where you are. Ask that when you see stories like this of God's holiness, that it'll pull you closer to God, not push you further away. Because it's so easy to go, I don't like this, therefore I'm out. Rather than the holiness of God drawing you to himself and seeing your need to be reconciled to him. So pray that God brings you to him, not that you don't move away from him during that. Go ahead and pray that right now. That you lean in rather than move away. I'd also love for you to pray that you'll be found faithful. Say, God, let me be faithful. We're dependent on him for that. Lord, let me be found faithful. If there's areas where you haven't been this week, last week, last year, ask the Lord to forgive you. Because as far as the east is from the west, your sins are removed. And lastly, I'd like you to pray that this week coming up, as you walk out these doors, that God will keep his love and grace and mercy on your mind. You'll think great thoughts about God and great thoughts about grace and pray that that will extend into you showing that to other people.